We're going to be palpating the humerus. So we're going to start by putting our body into an anatomical position to help us orient the proximal end of this humerus. So we'll get a palm up position. Uh, the arm can gently kind of just hang on the side of the table, dependent. It should be okay here. We're going to orient a couple bony landmarks of both the clavicle scapula to help us figure out exactly where our humerus is in space. But looking at that proximal end is really going to be the head, the lesser tubercle, greater tubercle, bicipital groove, and we'll discuss a little bit about the facets in this area. So I'm going to hold her by the wrist so I'm able to maneuver the humerus into medial and lateral internal external rotation. You're seeing a little bit of bony movement underneath the skin right here and that's going to be helpful for us to kind of identify what is humerus versus what is a chromion and of the scapula. So let's do that again one more time. You're able to see the humerus moving underneath the surface right in that area there. I'm going to palpate the top of this acromion and find its joint edge. So that's right here. So this is the front of the acromion. This is going to be the proximal part of the humerus, which is its head. I'm going to roll my fingertips in. This right here is the coracoid process. And I am on that proximal kind of head of the humerus. Okay. The next item I'm going to look for is the bicipital groove. And I'll kind of go back to a few things here. So the biceps tendon, biceps long head tendon specifically, is running up through what is known as the intertubercular sulcus or bicipital groove. So that's going to be here, and I know I'm on it because I'm going to go back and forth using medial and lateral rotation, and I'm able to strum the biceps tendon. I won't want to do this too many times to our body here because she will not like it. I'm going to apply some pressure on top of that tendon. I'm going to roll the arm in medial and there it goes. So I'm able to cross fiber and strum this biceps tendon and I'll make it move a couple times under the surface so you can easily kind of see that going up and down. So this is inside the bicipital groove. Therefore, medial to that bicipital groove is the lesser tubercle of the humerus, which is right here. Again, biceps tendon in the groove, roll medial. And I'm going to bring her into external rotation. And as I do that, the lesser tubercle lifts my fingers up and down. And up and down. Up and down. Let's do it one more time. Up and down. So this is going to be the insertion of subscapularis. Now we could ask for her to try to bring her arm towards her body. Good, and I do feel some tensing up underneath, but the problem with this is that the deltoid does medial rotation, pectoralis major does medial rotation, and subscapularis does medial rotation. So for me to say that medial rotation helps prove the lesser is kind of tricky because everything in this area is really doing that medial rotation. So I like to use the movement of the bony structure itself. If we were on the coracoid process, and I did that, I would not feel any bony motion. And as you saw, the biceps tendon long head is pretty easy to come across and feel, so you can use that to help orient the lesser. Now, since this is the biceps tendon, everything lateral to it, all the way from the front towards the back, is considered the greater tubercle of the humerus. So I'm gonna go in and just find that acromial angle here. So there's the posterior aspect of the humerus and that biceps tendon in the front. So everything that I'm currently pinching right now is the greater tubercle of the humerus. And I'm now gonna use rotation back and forth to feel both parts, the front and the back, wiggling kind of in my fingertips as it's basically going and shifting back and forth like this. Now, if you've studied some of your muscles of the greater tubercle, their attachments, we have three of them and they have different facets. So I'm going to sink in behind the clavicle in front of the spine of the scapula into this area right in here for supraspinatus. And supraspinatus is tendon, comes out underneath the acromion process and dropping down below it. And then we're going to tuck her arms straight up against her body, as much adduction as possible. And that's trying to lengthen that supraspinatus. Now the problem with this is it's also tightening up her middle deltoid. 
So for me to say that I'm only feeling supraspinatus would not be accurate, but what I'm trying to do is push through deltoid down towards the humerus. The other action that can be done is that you're gonna to try to grip onto the distal part of the humerus on supracondylar ridges or the epicondyles and try doing a little bit of an inferior traction. So I'm trying to pull the humerus down and that actually tries to separate it from the glenoid cavity a little bit, which is what helps tighten up supraspinatus. So that will pull on it. It's supraspinatus's job to kind of hold that humeral head up inside that fossa. So this is the superior facet of the greater tubercle of the humerus. I'm gonna go slightly more posterior. Here is that acromial angle and I'm gonna tuck up underneath it. And this is where infraspinatus is starting to insert. So superior facet, infraspinatus, posterior, inferior to that on what is called the middle facet of the humerus. And it'll really be hard to see from this view, but I'm cross fibering Terry's minor right here. And I'm gonna follow that up. And it also inserts into what is known as the inferior facet of the greater tubercle of the humerus. So if we had to do that in a one, two, three, I would have superior, I would have the middle, and I would have the inferior facet of the greater tubercle. Okay, so we've gone through most of the proximal landmarks. Deep in there is the head and the neck. It's not something we really discuss too much because um, they're not really muscle attachments. And that head and inside the glenoid, we can't really go further than just saying it's deep here. So as we palpate down the humerus and its shaft, the next item that we're gonna be looking for is on the lateral aspect. So I'm going to position her arms resting on her abdomen and I'm going to take my thumb down here and palpate the widest part of the distal humerus. This is known as the lateral epicondyle. This should be pretty easy for you to find. And if you wanted to confirm that, we'll come back to this later, but you could easily ask them to wiggle their fingers or extend their wrist up and down a few times, since this is the attachment for your common extensor tendon. I'm using this to orient myself on the lateral aspect of the humerus. And if I was in anatomical palm up, this would be neutral, but I wanna see that lateral part. Halfway down the lateral surface, so proximal end, distal end, halfway in the middle, is gonna be something known as the deltoid tuberosity, which is the insertion of the deltoid muscle. So as a visual, I know it's somewhere in here, but now I wanna to try to hone in and try to get as specific as possible. So a couple ways that you can do this. Um, for myself, the simplest way is to try to palpate deltoid and use it. So what I'm gonna do is a sink down to more of a muscular depth, pincher grasping the deltoid muscle, picking it up a little bit and following it down. And so we'll start to see as it kind of pinches and pulls towards that insertion point. I'll do that a couple times here. So I'm picking it up, moving it back and forth, picking it up, moving it back and forth. You can see it pinching down. It's so right about in here. As I pick that up, it doesn't want to lift up anymore. So I'm going to sink my fingertip in. Now, if we guesstimated that on the humerus, that looks pretty close to halfway, so I'm pretty happy with that. So now let's sink in and see if I can feel the tendon. And there it is right there. So we got a nice rubbery band feeling. It does not feel like muscle tissue above that. It's often a little bit more sensitive. The client doesn't necessarily like that as much, might be a little higher on a pain scale. Um, and this is showing me the deltoid tendon going into this tuberosity. Last thing to try and prove it, I wanna fire off the deltoid the majority of its fibers is one big action is abduction, especially for these middle fibers. So I'm gonna push on the outside of her humerus, good. And I can definitely feel that tendon and muscle belly starting to pull on it. So you can relax for me, good. So we're looking for these muscle fibers to all kind of anchor right around here. Okay, so that's in the middle of the humerus. And now we're gonna work our way down towards the distal end. We're just gonna change our camera view. Now that we have repositioned the camera, we're gonna look at the distal end of the humerus. 
So I'm bringing us back into our anatomical position and we're gonna be looking for the two widest parts of the joint. Down towards the bottom, the humerus is kind of in its shaft and then it starts to widen out into the two condyles, both the medial and lateral condyles, the distal end of the humerus. I'm going to flex the elbow and externally rotate her a little bit. So in this area here, this is still humerus versus this would be ulna. This sinking in quite deep would be the medial condyle of the humerus. And then it comes out to a kind of a sharpened point right in here known as the epicondyle or on top of condyle. So right in this location is our epicondyle, the medial one. And this is the common attachment of your flexors. So the common flexor tendon is utilizing this as an attachment. And so as a quick check, you can ask them to flex their wrist. So go ahead and do that, good. Or you could make a tight fist for me, and that's gonna be activating a muscle known as flexor digitorum superficialis, and relax. So either one of those, flexion of the wrist or a couple ulnar radial deviations, there's a lot of muscle tissue using this as a common attachment. So that's an easy proof of I'm on the medial epicondyle. If I was to go above that epicondyle, so I'm gonna sink in gently and go up from there, or proximal. This is known as the medial supercondylar ridge of the humerus. And why I said take caution is you actually have your ulnar nerve traveling from front, going in behind the medial end of this humerus. And so there it's right here. I'm not gonna push on that too hard because the client will not like that. Um, so as you kind of feel for this, don't dig really hard on the bone. And that's gonna go behind the medial epicondyle, right in this location right here, through what's known as groove for ulnar nerve. So if you haven't felt a nerve before, this is one of the superficial easy ones to feel. Often people refer to it as your funny bone. So as you kind of hook your finger in behind your medial epicondyle, do a gentle strum, kind of feels like a uncooked noodle or kind of a really ropey band, but don't strum too hard. Otherwise you're gonna give them some neurological shooting pain down their hand. So people often strike or hit this, causing some neurological symptoms. So again, right behind the medial epicondyle, this is the groove for the ulnar nerve. Okay, we're gonna switch over to a lateral view. I did this one just a little bit earlier in this video, but I'm gonna now feel for the outside of the lateral aspect of the humerus. Right here is again our epicondyle, the lateral epicondyle. So in this case, this is the common extensor tendon, extensors to the lateral, flexors to the medial. And if you can extend your wrist up off, perfect, and the back down, and wiggle your fingers a few times for me. Extensor digitorum plus multiple other muscles are all attaching to this location right here. Similar on the medial side, if I start to travel up superiorly from that epicondyle, I'm now on the lateral supercondylar ridge. Two prominent muscles that you will discuss for other pathologies, but one of them is gonna be brachioradialis. So that muscle is originating from that upper part of this, and then extensor carpi radialis longus is coming in from a lower part. So I'm actually gonna just change your arm position a little bit here into a neutral, which you can almost look at a thumb up position. I'm gonna provide some resistance on the radius and brachioradialis is activating, and I can follow that right into our lateral supercondylar ridge right here. Just change the angle just a little bit, and again, pull up for me, perfect. So right in here, lateral supercondylar ridge to that lateral epicondyle. So that is going to conclude the distal humerus palpation bone landmarks. All right, we have our person in a seated position, and we're gonna go back through all of the facets on the greater tubercle of the humerus from this position. So finding where the clavicle and the spine of the scapula are meeting, I'm just dropping a finger into the supraspinous fossa. We will travel lateral with supraspinatus, going underneath the acromion and then dropping off and attaching to the superior facet of the greater tubercle of the humerus. So I'm going to sink underneath her acromion process 
and strong anterior posterior on that. I am feeling some kind of fibery strands running up and down. As I had said previously, this could be deltoid. So I'm also gonna grab her humerus and just do a traction down on it to try and pull that humeral head and tighten it up. And I'll relax it and then pull it down. So you're doing almost like a gentle traction and pulling that head out just a little bit to see if you can feel a change in supraspinatus since deltoid is actually quite soft at that point, but supraspinatus would be really tight at that point. So here's our superior facet of the greater tubercle. Rolling around to the back, I'm just gonna rotate your shoulder a little bit this way. Perfect, here is the spine of the scapula and here is her acromial angle going right underneath it. So infraspinatus and the infraspinous fossa running in this direction. It's gonna go right below that angle and start to attach on the posterior part of the humerus. Again, the greater tubercle, and this is now the middle facet. Can you just start to externally rotate your arm? Perfect. And relax and go back down and just start to do that again. Good. So right in here is infraspinatus. And this one doesn't necessarily feel great, but I want to try and find the roundness of Terry's minor. So following up the lateral border, and then I'm going to sink back and forth. Here's our little roll of that round Terry's. And I'm going to follow that out until I get onto the back of the humerus, which is right in here. Again, just start to do that external rotation for me. Perfect, and relax. So this is the inferior facet. So I'll put all three fingers down again, one towards the top for superior, the angle just below that, more middle, and a little bit further down and posterior is gonna be the inferior facet, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor on the greater tubercle of the humerus.